challenge to remember. And then I'm going to introduce you to a few opportunities. So if you would like to facilitate an upcoming session, there are spots available for the winter 2019 um, semester. So you can share anything related to ed tech, classroom proven practices, things that you're keen on right now. And all you need to do is go to edtechontario.ca uh, and submit a proposal. You'll also find the image that is appended on your screen there. So a few upcoming sessions. We're in the H5P session today. On November 14th, we'll be looking at interface and interaction. And then on November 28th, creating accessible PowerPoint documents. And you can sign up for all of those sessions on the ETC website. I'd also like to uh, just remind you that the Advancing Learning Conference, a conference that is hosted by the ETC, is coming up in May 2019. It's always a great opportunity to learn, collaborate, network, uh, so please keep that on your sight lines as we uh, get into the winter and spring months. So, shall we begin? Yes, we shall. Let's do it. So, who are we? My name is Jessica O'Reilly. I work in the Cambrian College Teaching and Learning Innovation Hub as an instructional developer. And I'm Sarah Wendorf, uh, an instructional designer with the Teaching and Learning Hub as well with Jessica. And just to answer Terry Williams' question, uh, this is the virtual background from Zoom, so happy Halloween, everyone. These are real bat ears, like <laughs> physical bat ears. Sarah's going digital, but she's wearing a real Halloween sweater. So we're trying to be festive <laughs> during this lunch and learn session. As we uh, deliver our presentation, please feel free to participate uh, via the chat window or uh, through your mic, uh, interject as you see fit. But we will leave questions, a good amount of time at the end for, for some questions and discussion. So why are we here today? We're talking about H5P and I've made it clear that this is not a barbecue sauce, but what exactly is it then? Has anyone heard of H5P before the promo went out on Twitter? Have you worked with this tool? Uh, what were your initial impressions, Gina, Terry? Uh, I was aware that it, well, what I, my understanding, and this is Terry, is that it was um, a plugin or um, a tool that works with WordPress or Pressbooks uh, to enable interactive content uh, using HTML5. That's well, my understanding of it. That was an excellent response. If I could send you a treat, I certainly would do so. Awesome. Gina's worked with the tool minimally, looks like a good tool to create quick interactive content. Absolutely. I conducted a similar poll. I, I presented on H5P to my uh, doctoral cohort. So I'm doing a doctorate in distance education. And most of the cohort had not heard of H5P. So if you're new to the tool, that's great. Uh, it is relatively new. Uh, so it doesn't surprise me that there's some silence on that end. So what I'm going to do today is orient you to H5P generally, the ethos of the company, and all of the different options that they have on offer right now. And then Sarah will jump in and get into interactive video more specifically. We find that interactive video is the most popular content type at our college, so we wanted to do a bit of a deeper dive uh, into that specific tool. It is going to be an overview, however, so if you want to get into the real finer points of designing interactive video we can point you to some helpful resources and then Sarah and I are always available to talk H5P and then we'll end the conversation with several use cases that I found from uh, right from kindergarten through to higher ed and corporate training all around the world so that's the game plan I hope that you're uh, interested and and this is living up to your expectations because uh, the trains in motion so H5P it's a content authoring tool, which basically means that it's a, a platform that allows you to design interactive learning objects. I love it because it's free, it's open source, web-based, and quite easy to use. Basically, anyone can go to h5p.org, create a free account, and select from 39 different content types. 
when you create learning objects on H5P, they're responsive and, de and device agnostic. So that means even if you're designing on a laptop, once your students access that, that learning object, they can look at it on a laptop, a Mac, a tablet, an iPhone, and it's going to work properly, which has been a real challenge in instructional design land for the past few, few years. Basically, all you need is an internet connection and you can get started. Um, and so what you'll be producing is HTML5 packages. So some of you may have heard that Flash is being phased out, Flash is, is dying. Well, HTML5 kind of won that fight. And so if you're designing with the future in mind, you want to be aligning yourself with HTML5 and web-based content. I'll talk a little bit about the H5P core team. So obviously they're, they're a small and, and youngish group of uh, Norwegians. It's a community driven project, but they do have a core team of developers to support uh, some of the, the pragmatic uh, developments. So they, they do source out contributions from the community, but they also have this dedicated team uh, hired and working full time. So the parent organization to H5P is named Jubal, and they were founded in 2013. That's the parent organization. So it just speaks to how young this, this tool actually is. And development on H5P specifically sh started shortly after that. So right from the beginning, the company's uh, vision was to empower everyone to create, share, and reuse interactive content. So to answer the comment in the chat, how does H5P compare to the big rapid authoring tools like Storyline and Captivate? Um, the ethos of this company is to empower everyone to use the tool for free, whereas the, the more proprietary software is really a one user, one license model. So for example, Storyline 3 costs $840 Canadian per year to use, whereas H5P is completely free and open. The functionality is more limited than Storyline and experienced instructional designers might find it a bit rough around the edges. However, those who are new to instructional design, educators who are, are teaching online for the first time, for example, they would find the tool far more accessible and the learning curve less steep than something like a storyline. So you can achieve quite a bit with the H5P content types, but you're not going to end up with those uh, closed, uneditable SCORM packages that, that Storyline's known for. Hopefully that answers the question. Um, before I move on, I just want to take a moment to pause and talk about what I mean by interactive content. So in this case, we're talking about content that basically asks students to do more than simply read or watch. So they're being prompted to input uh, at various points. In the instructional design world, typically interactive contents, content Acts, asks learners to react to prompts on screen, um, but really we're talking about participation. We're talking about less transmission didactic and more uh, collaborative constructive type learning. One thing I forgot to mention on the last slide is like obviously H5P is very well aligned with the ethos of open education as opposed to the more capitalist uh, software that we're talking about in terms of Captivate Storyline. Here's a screenshot of the various content types. There's so many that I actually had to fit it on three slides. So again, we're talking about a company that's been active for only a few years and they've already pushed out all of these different content types. They tend to um, focus on either multimedia options, game options, or question types as a starting point. To be honest, they've been so rapid in their in their output that I haven't had time to work with all of these tools. I've picked the few that seem most relevant to me, but if you go to h5p.org, I encourage you to just look at their various content types just to get a sense of the scope available to you. 
once you build something on h5p.org, you need a place to put it. So anybody can, can house content on the h5p.org platform. If you have CMS or LMS systems listed on this screen, you can actually build H5P content directly in that platform. So for example, at Cambrian College, we use the Moodle LMS and we have the H5P plugin enabled so we can build our H5P content directly in the learning management system. If you're running something like Blackboard, D2L, those other learning management systems that do not yet have a plugin for H5P, you would need to build the content on that site and then pull it into your LMS. And I think this is indicative of the fact that Moodle is an open software. So the, the core team of developers can ensure that the plugin will, will work properly and it. So open software tends to play nice with other open software. But as you can see, in the short time that H5P has been in existence, they've created a huge market share. They've obviously been picking their platforms carefully and, and trying to uh, ensure that they get um, the most reach possible. All right, so this is my turn. Thank you, Jess. Uh, now we're going to look at a quick overview of the features of H5P interactive video. Next slide. Perfect. Uh, so here you'll see each of the elements um, on the toolbar for the interactive video editor. So this is when you're ready to create your interactive video. This is the screen that you'll see and you'll receive this toolbar here. Um, any of the elements that you see here can be added to your video um, anywhere that you wish along the timeline. It's a super easy drag and drop interface. Um, so starting from the left, if you look, there's uh, the label, the text box, the table, the link, and the image. Those items are more like uh, static elements that you can layer on top of your video. And when you get started into statements, single choice set, multiple choice, and all of the other question types to the right, uh, those are the more uh, interactive features that you can add to your video. All right, so let's go on to the live demo online. So I will try to share my screen with you. All right. So getting started in creating your H5P video, you'll start on h5p.org. So as Jessica mentioned, we use Moodle here at Cambrian. So um, we have a plugin available to, to use. However, if you're using another LMS like Blackboard or D2L, or even if you're on WordPress, um, you can use any, uh, you can, you can go to h5p.org, create your content, and then embed it right into your site. So getting started on h5p.org, the first thing that you'll need to do is create an account. So you'll just click uh, add an account at, um, here in the top right. I've already added my account, so I'm just going to go right into it here. So this is what it looks like when you're logged in. The first thing that you'll need to do if you are creating a brand new uh, interactive video is create new content. So you'd click on this button here. And this is where you can input your information. So for example, I'll just put a sample video. And then when you're selecting your H5P content type, this is that giant list of content types that Jess was mentioning where she had to split it across three screens. Um, and you'll notice if you're using this often, there, there are new content types being added frequently. So the first one I'll select here is interactive video. And you'll see there's three steps to create your video. So step one is upload or embed your video. So here's where you're gonna put your YouTube link. Um, we often use YouTube uh, for uploading our videos. So for example, let me see if I can grab my URL here for my video and just throw it in there. So just copy paste the URL of your YouTube video, click insert, and then you can move on to step two. As you'll see, the video loads up here, and here's that toolbar that I just showed you with all of the different features that you can add to your video. So just for an example, you just click and drag right onto your video, and then there's the settings. So this webinar, we don't have the time to go through all of the how-to. We just want to give you a really nice overview of the different features. But if you are interested in learning how, they have great um, 
uh, how to section on their website. You can also reach out to Jess and I directly and we're happy to, uh, to walk you through that and, and give you some tips. So the next thing that I'd like to show you is uh, a video that I created using H5P interactive video. And here it is. So pumpkin carving 101, just in, in honor of Halloween today. So I found this video on YouTube and brought it into H5P. Um, and then I've layered on a bunch of interactives. So what I'll do next is I'll show you, um, I've, I'll walk you through the video and uh, just introduce the different types of content that you can add to your video. And for the purposes of this webinar, I just muted the audio for the video so that I can, uh, un so I can speak to each of those elements. So just in starting the video, I just pressed play. The very first interactive that shows up is called a questionnaire. So what I'm doing here is I'm assessing prior learning. Um, so for example, have you ever carved a pumpkin? If I select yes, um, you can put some uh, feedback prompts in there. So awesome, you can skip this video and go to advanced pumpkin carving. Uh, say you select no, great, watch this introductory video to get started. So then click next and it says, you know, you've su successfully answered all the questions, click submit. We've just assessed your prior knowledge, muahahaha. All right, so we'll continue with the video. So the video plays, I'll just pause it right here. Um, this is what's called a label. And you'll notice that as I press play again, it, it remains on the screen as the video plays. So I've displayed this as a poster. Um, and you can place this anywhere on the screen. You can resize it, you can have it pause the video, or you can have it play as the video is playing. So video continues. It's just describing the different tools that you need to uh, carve a pumpkin. Then they get into the steps of carving a pumpkin. Here's another interactive. This is a multiple choice question. And you'll notice this one uh, also displayed as a poster. This one actually pauses the video, so it, it it kind of focuses your attention on the question. And this type of question allows you to input single or multiple choice correct answers. Um, and you can change the settings. So you can enable uh, a retry button, a show solution button, and uh, this is kind of what it looks like. So what safety equipment do you need to carve a pumpkin? Select all that apply. So say I do safety goggles and face mask. So check. And you'll see that uh, the question will prompt and tell me which ones I've gotten correct and which ones were incorrect. Um, and then I get a score based on that. So I've got zero to two because I needed to get them all correct. And here are the buttons that uh, show the solution or you can enable a retry. So if I click show solution, it shows me which questions I should have selected instead. And then there's the retry as well, but I'll just continue. And the in interesting thing about that type of question is you can also randomize the question. Um, you can also give one point for the whole task if you'd rather just give one point for each interactive that you add. Um, now, as I'm playing the video, I'm continuing, you'll see there's a true or false. Uh, this is called, uh, this is just a, a button that's displayed instead of um, pausing the video and showing it full screen. Uh, this I just added as a button. So it's playing, it, it shows up while the video is playing, just like some of the other ones that I showed you. But if I click on it, it gives me a question. So pumpkin seeds are delicious, true or false? Of course they are. Check. So I've got one point. And then you can press continue and the video continues. So you'll see I, I set it so that it stays on the screen for a few seconds. Now here, I'm, not, I'm just going to pause it just to show you, but uh, this is an example of an image, and I've just had it layered onto my video. And continue. So here's another uh, content type. This is called Crossroads. And this one I set to pause the video. Um, and it allows some choice for your viewer. So you can program the different options that will allow you to jump to various time uh, points on the timeline. So for example, uh, what do you want to learn about next? So you can prompt your viewer to choose what part of the video they want to learn about next. So I want to learn how to carve the pumpkin 
or I just want to see the final carving, which is a really cool feature because you can almost build like a choose your own adventure style video with some pre-planning uh, during your video development. So for example, uh, I'm just gonna click, I just want to learn how to carve the pumpkin. If I were to select the second one, it would skip me to the end of the video where they show the final carving. So I'll click here, great, keep on watching. So as they're carving, so throughout this whole sequence of them carving, I've added this link at the bottom. This is another content type that you can add. Um, so if it's clicked, it opens up a browser and navigates to that link. So I programmed this to stay on for quite a while on, along the timeline, so you'll see how that looks. So the whole time that they're carving, there's the link providing some tips. So I'll just pause it. Uh, again, so this um, pop-up right here is called text. So added text tips uh, will display for a short time. When you click it, you'll see that <laughs> don't cut your finger while you're carving your pumpkin. So there's a little tip. Um, you can put also in there other interactive elements. You can jump to another location on the timeline with uh, a text, or you can also link out to a website. So that's a pretty cool feature. So that just displays for a little bit and then disappears. And you'll see here's my second tip that shows up. Put on a Band-Aid if you cut your finger. So just giving some helpful tips to the viewers. And the neat thing about this too, if you notice that we've got two elements, two interactive elements layered on top of each other, showing up at the same time on the screen, which I absolutely love. All right, so here we're at another different uh, content type. This is fill in the blank. Now the interesting thing about fill in the blank is when you're building this style of question, you can type in your answers um, in the back end of the system. So when you're actually creating this thing, uh, you type in the whole answer. So pumpkins are the color. And then I put the word orange in there and you put asterisks around the, the answer. So H5P will automatically turn those asterisks into blanks, which makes your fill in the blank question. So I'm just gonna put some answers in there. Orange, pumpkins are round, pumpkins have seeds, and let's put guts inside of them. You need to scoop these out before carving. So now I'm gonna check my answers, and you'll see that the, I've gotten these ones correct, this one is incorrect. I'm gonna show solution and you'll see that the options for the correct answer for the one that I got wrong here were seeds or pulp. That's a really cool feature for the fill in the blanks because you can offer multiple correct answers and just separate them with a slash. So if, if I would have put pulp and seeds in there, that would have marked that as correct. So really neat function there. Um, let's see here. There are different options that you can, different settings that you can enable or disable with the fill in the blanks. So for example, you can disable the retry button. So I, I've enabled it, you see it here. But say you're using this as an assessment for your students um, and maybe it's, it's used as a test, you probably don't wanna have the retry button if you wanna use it as a, as a you know, formative assessment. Uh, this, the show solution button can be enabled, disabled, um, and you can also allow options for enabling or disabling uh, case sensitive answers. So here I've enabled uh, case, sorry, I've disabled case sensitive so that even if I put a capital O here, uh, that still marks it as a correct versus uh, a lowercase O for, for the word orange. Um, also, I just noticed this this morning, but there's also a feature that uh, allows uh, minor spelling errors, which is pretty cool for a dragon, or, or sorry, a fill in the blank type of question. Um, so say your student, you know, uses the American spelling versus the Canadian spelling. Well, it would still mark them as correct, which is, that's a pretty cool um, feature I find. So let's continue. All right, so just, just to note, I'm just pausing it here. So if you go back to that crossroads question where it says, I just wanna see the final carving, this is where it would have skipped ahead on the timeline.
All right, so now we've gotten to the end of our video and we're kind of at some culminating activities. This one here is an example of a drag and drop. And I personally love this one and have found so many uses for the drag and drop style question, especially with faculty here at Cambrian. A lot of our anatomy, physiology, math, sciences, even like English drag and drop, you know, um, the words into the sentences. Uh, people love this and, and it's just such a slick uh, feature. So here, the way that I've built this question is I've added a, a background image to my question just to make it a little interesting and nice looking. Um, I've created these drop zones here. So I have four drop zones and four labels. I've also added a little tip here. And if you click on it, it says hint, you'll need a keyhole star to get started. So the question here, how do you carve a pumpkin, drag the steps in order from first to last? So say, okay, so my hint told me I'll need a keyhole saw to get started. So I should probably get my tools ready first. And it's, it's a nice user interface because it highlights the, uh, the, the drop zone as you're dragging the elements over top of it. So get the tools ready. I think we need to cut a hole in the bottom next. Then maybe scoop out the seeds and then maybe cut out design. Let's try that. So if I scroll down, check. And I got all four correct, hooray. And uh, yeah, so basically if, if you get them incorrect, you can enable them to, uh, you, you can allow them to retry if, if so. Um, let's see, continue. And now here we've reached the final culminating activity, which is another questionnaire. So similar to uh, the pre-assessment that we did at the beginning of the video, this is kind of like the post-assessment. Um, and here I've built a series of questions composed of both open-ended and multiple choice. And in the top right here, you'll see one out of four. So I've programmed four questions in sequence to, to appear to the viewer. So how would you rate your knowledge of pumpkin carving after watching this video? So if you select excellent, I'm a master carver now, and select continue, you could also put some feedback text in here. Great, we're glad it was valuable for you. Or for example, if you select uh, poor, I'm not confident in my pumpkin carving abilities. Um, sorry to hear that. Let's continue on to the next video so you can learn more. And then I provided a link for the, for the viewer. So click next to my next question. Did you enjoy this video? Let's say you selected yes or no. Um, tell us why or why not in the next step. And here is where you can type your answer. Type your answer here. And then you can submit. What did you dislike about the video? Same thing. So press continue. You've su successfully answered all the questions. Submit. And here's an example of like a final success screen. So you can insert your own text here. I've put, uh, you've now completed the introduction to pumpkin carving video. Please proceed to the novice pumpkin carving video. Um, yeah, so that's basically it for the, uh, for the um, demo. Now this, for example, is called a summary. And if you're using this for marks, your students can see which questions they got correct and which one's incorrect. Um, and then it gives them a final score here. So if I click Submit, it gives me my uh, final score. Uh, for example, questionnaire, because those are just subjective questions, it'll just say that it was answered. Um, so basically, what I want to add to this is, this is just one example. Uh, that you can use to start building your own H5P interactive videos. I'll include the link to this interactive video in the chat box for our webinar. Um, you can download or embed this video with the interactives already built, just like I showed you here, uh, into your own LMS or anywhere that HTML is accepted, such as a website, or you can use the embed code to put into a D2L Blackboard uh, anywhere if you don't have that plugin. And I strongly believe that these tools uh, are what will really help propel the open education movement, as Jess mentioned earlier. Um, it just, it makes it so easy to share resources for the purposes of retaining, reusing, revising, remixing, and redistributing if you add that Creative Commons license to it. So um, just to note that H5P is currently working on a new content repository where authors of H5P content uh, such as all of you after this webinar, uh, can submit their best work to H5P under a new showcase that they're going to include on their website. And 
Interestingly enough, they're asking uh, for you to submit and they have free t-shirts if your submission is selected for showcasing on their website. So that's pretty cool. I'm probably going to submit one <laughs> just for the free t-shirt. Um, so yeah, I, I can provide some links uh, once Jess um, continues on with the presentation. And uh, yeah, great. Hope that was helpful. <laughs> Okay, let me take back over from Sarah. Uh, there was a question that I didn't quite get to regarding um, basically D2L and results of interactive video. I can see that there is development work happening on the D2L front. Uh, it's not our learning management, so I'm not as familiar, however, but Sarah, if you wouldn't mind maybe researching that while I move on with the conversation, that would be great. Okay, so at this point, I'm going to get into a couple use cases and then we'll get into a more formal discussion. I, I wanted to just hit on some of the pedagogical and technological advantages to H5P. We talked a little bit about this at the beginning, uh, but I just wanted to point out that um, Kaltura's 2018 report really stresses the ubiquity of video specifically in education. Uh, right through from kindergarten through to higher ed, educators are incorporating video into their teaching practice, but we're not seeing higher education uh, catching up to the elementary sector in terms of students' video production. So I really see uh, a, a uh, potential for H5P in the hands of students because it's a free and available platform uh, to empower learners to become the producers of these kinds of learning objects. And I think there's going to be some, some interesting use cases emerging. As educators get more familiar with the platform, they'll start encouraging students to produce using the platform, or at least I hope. And that could be a, a really interesting way to have students, for example, annotate a video that that you assign uh, or find relevant videos but bring in the, the learning context through their annotations. Uh, the Kaltura report also nods to the fact that video will be important. Everyone has the sense that as we uh, become more blended and distributed in our learning, video is playing a huge role. So I think that we can leverage tools like H5P to strategically uh, transition from that more transmission model uh, to something that's a little bit more dialectic and constructive in nature. The other piece that faculty on our campus are enjoying uh, is the fact that H5P can be uh, adopted without any IT ticketing requests. So because it's a web-based platform, we can go online, create that account, and start using the tool on Sunday night uh, on a whim without having to go through the, the procurement or installation process. I also really like that it's free and it's open to use. Um, as the H5P deploys its content database, its hub, we're going to be able to go there as a first point uh, to curate existing objects and then adapt them for our particular context. And I also like that it's very portable. So for example, if I build something on h5p.org, download it locally, and then bring it into my LMS, the whole process takes about three seconds and it doesn't break everything in a million ways that we've seen uh, happen with SCORM packages, for example. And the instructional designers in the room probably know what I mean when I say SCORM packages don't port very well. These HTML5 packages truly do. So let's talk about a couple use cases. Um, I'll go through about four or five from different sectors. So this is an interesting application. Uh, the University of Colorado had to train up over 30,000 staff very quickly on a new software that kind of had to roll out immediately. And they relied heavily on H5P interactive video to achieve this goal, um, so much so that they've become huge proponents of, of the program and you'll see them on h5p.org. They won a bronze award for their deployment back in 2016. So they were very early adopters of the tool and, and found great success with it. 
in an elementary context. So this particular elementary school in India has fully embraced the philosophy of open education and they use exclusively open software uh, in their teaching and learning practice and have started relying more on discrete H5P interactive content rather than larger textbooks to uh, empower their, their educators to create curricula for learners and then also, uh, you know, revising that content as the learners use it in situ. So this is kind of a, a really nice grounded practice, almost like an action research example where practitioners are learning as they do and evolving uh, as they as they become more familiar with the tool. In a secondary context, uh, the Norwegian Digital Learning Arena, NDLA, partnered up with H5P's parent company almost right out of the gate. And the reason for this was they saw that Flash was coming to an end and they had much uh, many Flash-based learning objects that they needed to transition. So now when instructional designers, content experts submit to this open platform, they're encouraged to submit H5P interactive content. So as vendors submit to the site, uh, since all of their content on this site is Creative Commons licensed, I see almost like a ripple effect happening where secondary school teachers are gonna navigate to the site, find relevant content, realize that it's Creative Commons licensed and, and revisable, and therefore a whole new cohort of users will emerge simply because of this uh, very important and strategic partners, partnership. So that's pretty positive, I would say. In a post-secondary context, this particular German uh, faculty member used interactive video to achieve a project titled All in One for All. So his problem was students were searching YouTube for uh, inordinate amounts of time to find videos relevant to their particular learning needs. Instead, he wanted to create one video that was relevant to all learners. And so it's a very Khan Academy style tutorial video. But if you look on the right, you see um, the logic that has gone into this particular tutorial video. So students get to opt out of certain content, uh, jump ahead, rewatch content if it was uh, t you know, difficult or dense, slow the video down, et cetera, based on their inputs. Uh, so I see this as a really powerful example of H5P interactive video uh, being thought of and uh, thought out from the design phase, basically from the storyboarding phase, where you can imagine those branching scenarios and build for them strategically. One of the last use cases I'll share is uh, this particular English language professor in Turkey was introduced to H5P when he started collaborating on a MOOC. And I wanted to bring up MOOCs because of course they're so heavily reliant on video. I see a next logical step for the MOOC, at least the C MOOC, would be to add some of these interactive features in so that that passive learning becomes a little bit more interactive and engaging, uh, just enhance seeing that, that particular model, taking it one step further. I'll end with a little bit of futurism. Um, so one relatively new development, at least in our Ontario context, is the partnership between H5P and Pressbooks. So Pressbooks is an e-text publishing platform, and they now allow H5P interactions to be embedded within textbooks. So in my mind, this is going to completely blow open our definition of the static textbook, and I can't wait to see what educators are going to do with that particular uh, app smash opportunity. I also, as I mentioned, really want to see some student-generated content and I'll be experimenting with that next semester. So wish me luck as I pitch this to my, my students and try to convince them that they too can be instructional designers and learn from the process. And then finally, H5P is having its second annual conference. As Sarah mentioned it, just one more nod to the fact that in early December, those big splashy announcements that H5P has likely been sitting on, such as new plugins, uh, new functionality, accessibility features, and the like, um, will probably come, uh, come out in early December as a part of that uh, H5P conference. 
conference. So keep an eye on them on Twitter, particularly in early December. And that uh, leads us to the end of our formal presentation. I see Sarah snuck in a little plug for our Teaching and Learning Hub. We do have some content available on our Teaching and Learning Hub website. It's uh, something that Sarah designed this summer and should help you with some of the more nitty gritty elements of building H5P interactive videos. Anything you wanted to add there, Sarah? Uh, I think that's good, Jess. We basically just, uh, we designed the Hub Studio on our website to be a place for faculty to get very quick, relevant information, not specifically to Cambrian, but we do try to add uh, some references to our LMS and, uh, you know, particular examples that we use here at Cambrian, um, but it is available and open to anyone uh, to have a look at. So I'll put a link to that in the chat box. Awesome. And last but not least, final nudge, register for the upcoming webinars, um, sign up to facilitate a session, and uh, see you at Advancing Learning in May. So now we'll open the floor up to all of you. Um, any questions at all, feel free to jump on the mic, jump on the chat. Uh, we can take the remainder of the hour to, uh, you know, just have the conversation based on your interests. I see a question from uh, Brian. How did you replace the background in Zoom? Uh, so this is, <laughs> so I'm, actually, I'm using a green screen. I don't know if you can see the edges of the green screen in my video here. Uh, but basically, so our video guy, Jeff, uh, has a green screen. He set it up right behind me. Um, and uh, Zoom has this really cool feature where in, in your video settings, you can add a virtual background. So we were testing this out yesterday and I thought, how cool would that be to have something Halloween-y behind me and I thought let's try it out and see what happens so I'm glad you like the background it's fun I love it if you're interested in promoting H5P at your particular institutions, I recognize quite a few teaching and learning uh, staff and faculty in the room. Uh, feel free to reach out to us. We're happy to share our uh, slides with you if you wanted to adapt them for your context. I should have been mindful to slap a Creative Commons license on there. I will, and uh, we can share that out post-session when we link to the uh, the EdTech Ontario website with our, our recording. We can also share our uh, licensed slide deck there as well. There's also a question here just from uh, Ian asking great potential with H5P, curious about accessibility. Um, so j my response to that is it is possible to build uh, accessible learning objects using H5P and we did that with our learning center here with their peer tutoring program. Um, there's another content type called H5P course presentation and with that one it's kind of like a you're taking PowerPoint uh, it's like PowerPoint 2.0 so uh, it's basically you can build it like slides just like in PowerPoint but all of these interactive features that we talked about today are available in uh, like a slideshow format. So instead of an interactive video, you're doing an interactive slideshow. And the way that we've made that accessible is we've included all the text files. We've got um, audio narration overlaid, which we've set to automatically play. So every time a slide is advanced, the audio will appear. Um, and then there's also the, the text to go with it. Um, and then all the elements within it, you can program to have um, you know, the metadata so that uh, someone who needs the accessibility features, they can click on the various features and, uh, and have that available to them. Yeah, um, I see the question regarding copyright, Ian. It's a great question and one that I've been researching. I reached out to YouTube directly and, and I haven't received a response yet. Um, H5P is a little bit vague on the issue. You can always, um, you know, base your, you'd essentially have to search for the YouTube video first and then double check if it is Creative Commons licensed. YouTube producers can Creative Commons license their videos. However, there's no nice clean way to filter out cr like exclusively Creative Commons licensed videos. So you kind of have to find it first and then check the, the licensing after. For now, it's... Um, 
you know, I think the way H5P is interpreting this is all we're doing is linking. The embed code is enabled. We're layering on top of not altering the original. So we'll see how that plays out. Honestly, I haven't really found a straight answer despite really truly searching for one. Um, so I'm erring on the side of caution for now, but um, I, I can't imagine that this gray area will last too long as interactive video becomes more and more popular. The way that our librarian on campus reads it is, we are simply using a link. Um, so we're, we're not altering, we're not profiting. She thinks it's okay. We'll see, we'll see where it goes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right, Peter. It's it's a skin on top of. Yeah, and, and kind of the way that we've interpreted that too with our with our campus librarian is, uh, as a YouTube creator, you have the option to enable or disable the share button. And if I may or may not be correct on this, but I think TED Talks might not have the share. Anyhow, so if you do encounter a video that does not allow you to share, then there's a clear indication there that you can't use it for an interactive video uh, example. But like we're saying here in the chat and what Jess mentioned, uh, there's always that link back to the original content. So you just click the little YouTube icon in the bottom right corner of any interactive video that you grab from YouTube and it links right back to the original content. So. Yeah, our librarian essentially read it as the same as embedding within the learning management system without interactive options uh, layered on top. So that's that's what we've been operating under. And I think an issue may arise if you put your own copyright uh, license on top of something that you create from someone else's YouTube video. So the example that I showed was from Better Homes and Gardens. Uh, they produced that video. So if I were to put my own copyright on that video, I think that would become a problematic situation. Any other questions? <laughs> Hopefully that was uh, helpful orienting information for you. Um, if you do end up using H5P as a result of this little lunch and learn session, please tweet us about it. I'd love to hear uh, where you go from, from this point on. And uh, as I said, we're, we're happy to field any questions. We're you know, just, just getting started with this platform as well so we can learn alongside you and uh, happy to share any of the content we've already created for you to uh, adapt for your own context as well. I think we have our Twitter uh, handles on the next slide if you'd like to be in touch with us. And we'll share this slideshow here. Uh, oh, Jess, you were gonna add a CC license to that, correct? Yeah. So we'll, we'll share it out after. Oh, we could share it now. Why don't we do that? Sure. Let's do that. You have our permission. It is recorded. <laughs> <laughs> Feel free to use, modify. So I've just uh, shared the bit.ly to our Google Slides. All right, great feedback. Thanks, everyone. Glad you found this helpful. All right, well, uh, feel free to sign off and enjoy your Halloween. Um, we really appreciate you coming out and look forward to the next Lunch and Learn session. We'll stay online for the next 10 minutes or so, should anyone have uh, questions. If you want to private chat with us, if you don't want to share the question, that's cool too. Uh, we're, we're here for the next nine minutes and counting. <laughs> Uh, Sarah, Jess, it's Terry speaking. Hi, um, Terry. Yes. Hi. Uh, first of all, thanks. That was really, really awesome. 
Um, I want to ask about uh, the other content that's available on H5P. And I know that, that really the point of this is that I should go and like poke around in that, <laughs> sign up. But I'm just curious if you have like, uh, like a little quick overview of other than an interactive video, what other kind of HTML5 content or other content does H5P like facilitate? I've, so I started with interactive video and I'm most familiar with that particular type, but then the second tool that I used was um, course presentation. So course presentation is a very simplified, like even more simplified version of a, a slide where uh, than say a Google slides, but I was able to use it within a, a course on universal design for learning. And so of course, the content itself needed to be UDL friendly. Uh, and I was able to achieve that with the inter the course presentation tool. So basically it's a series of slides that can embed multimedia. So I had audio files linked in there, uh, full transcript linked in there, um, embedded images, videos with alt text and the like. So that would be one, worth checking out. It looks really nice on a phone, a tablet, um, just on a laptop. And what I like is students aren't required to actually download anything. Um, so when they open up my Moodle course, all of the contents there for them. I've actually embedded within an iframe so they don't even have to click the title to view it. They can just get on with it. So that makes for a really nice um, end user experience, I find. And so that would be the, the other content type that I'd recommend you check out. Sarah, have you used any others? Yeah, and uh, I'm quite familiar with the drag and drop. I struggled a lot, just to be honest. I struggled a lot learning how to use the drag and drop because it's like a three-step process. You have to do like the drop zone, then the draggable elements, and then program everything to fit together. So it was the programming part that I was really struggling with. I finally figured it out. And once you get it, it's, it's super easy after that. Uh, but the great thing too is um, all of those elements in the toolbar that I showed for the interactive video are all available individually. So if you just want to create a discrete object that is just a drag and drop activity, you can do that or just a multiple choice activity or just a questionnaire. Um, so there's, there's those options too. And one thing that I showed just yesterday when I was kind of playing around is uh, one called column. And it's really nice because you can, you can build one object that has multiple interactives within it. So you can have a multiple choice and then some text and then a video and then uh, a course presentation and, and mix everything all together in one place. So it's really, really cool. Uh, that's awesome. Thank you. Uh, okay, I'm going to drop out. Thanks so much. See you at the next one. Thank you. See you, Terry. Thanks. <laughs> Hi, it's Brian here. Uh, just, I've, I've never used Moodle before, but uh, we use uh, D2L. I find that uh, it, it gets difficult for students to, to try to navigate through D2L, at, you know, once the course gets fairly large. Um, could this be used in some way that, that sort of at the beginning, say, of a unit, there, there is uh, 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 an, HP, an HP5 device that would then allow them to select links within the D2L to go to certain content and, and let them navigate that way? Yes, there is that option. Um, I, I haven't done that personally myself, but I have seen it in use. And it's almost like a table of contents. So you can build it. I'm trying to think how you can do that. There's a navigation hotspot. That's actually a really cool one that you can use where if you've got a screenshot of, of a website or even just text on a screen or even an image, you can um, program little hotspots on that image that if someone clicks on a certain spot on the image uh, or on the text, uh, some, some kind of content will pop up. So it could be text, could be a link, could be an image, could be a video. Um, so that would be a really, I think, useful uh, use for something like a table of contents or, or a navigation style uh, piece of content. Okay, all right, thanks very much. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Yeah, that's a good idea, Sarah. If you took a screenshot of your Moodle course and then hotspot it as part of like a course overview in week one, 
even if it's not linking to the content, just annotating, okay, here's where you find contact information for the faculty member. Here's mm -hmm. your assignment drop boxes, et cetera, et cetera. That would be a really neat way to do a course overview. I always tend to go to video for that stuff, but it could be a static image too. Anything that helps them with that cognitive load that they experience in the learning management system, eh? uh, it's helpful. Yeah, and, and if you still want to stick with video, you can have the interactive um, image with the hotspots, and then when they click on a hotspot, a video shows up. Yeah. So you could click on your image as the instructor, and it could be your introduction video. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to do that this winter. <laughs> but what, Thank what would you. They, now I have what, an idea. What would they be pasting in there, or what would I be pasting in? Is, is, there a, a, is the content link, is that actually a link, or is that... Like, how would I direct them to different spots within uh, within my D2L class? Um, so if you've got, uh, so say we're working from a screenshot of your course, mm -hmm. um, and you've got uh, that as an image file, so you start with putting the image um, in your, like, I guess you would start with H5P uh, hotspot. I think that's what I said, navigation hotspot. Um, so start by putting the image in there. And then there's different features in the toolbar. So when you're using the navigation hotspot, your toolbar changes to, to uh, include uh, text. I think there's a link, uh, video image. There's, there's a few different features that you can um, add. So when you add a hotspot, then you can select, okay, when a student clicks on this hotspot, what shows up? So it could be uh, an annotation from you. It could be a link to uh, a specific page on your course. It could be a video that comes up, or it could be an image uh, showing some, some other explanation for your course. Um, yeah, and I see Gina's comment here. This would be great to create a timeline with hotspots as well. There is an actual uh, H5P timeline, which I haven't used yet, and there's a lot of potential there, especially for any, any courses that really look at, um, you know, time and space and history. The timeline tool is one that I plan to use uh, this coming winter term. So one of my course objectives, it's a critical thinking course, and it's um, describe the history of thinking over time. Like, wow, okay, well, that's a big one. So what I'm actually going to do is get uh, the students to go out and find some, some relevant information, and then I'll curate it and add it all to one big timeline for them as an introduction to here's H5P and here's what we can do with it as a group. Okay, now over to you. Um, I'm gonna show you how to use some of these content types too. So it's kind of, I guess it's a flipped classroom, but the flip is uh, they, they do all of the curation work and I summarize rather than, I guess the opposite. But we'll see, we'll see how it goes. But the timeline tool is, it's quite cool. It's, it's very attractive on the, on the end user side. I find it nice to look at, easy to navigate um, and adding in those hotspots. I just find H5P plays well with the rest of the internet. So it's, it's quite easy to create all of these, um, you know, like rabbit holes for students to, mm -hmm. to wander into. And I think that's a good thing. Yeah, would, it, would it, you be able to um, either use the, the timeline or the, the hotspots to be able to also then show sort of progress that, that okay, so they've, they've done these two content items, so they've clicked on those and gone to whatever that's going to take them to, uh, but be able to see the ones that still haven't been, uh, that, that haven't been clicked on, or like would you be able to tell the difference? I, I'm not sure if it would work automatically as students are completing the activities, mm -hmm. um, but I could see value in using an almost like a syllabus mm -hmm. or your topical outline where week one, these are the activities that we're going to do. Watch these videos, um, click on these links, uh, you know, complete these activities. So you could almost link to various elements within your course on a timeline format so students can easily see week one, here's what I need to do, week two, here's what I need to do, and, and you can almost kind of cross link too. So you can, you can be like, okay, you know, jump to week nine to learn about this thing or jump to week two to learn about this thing or remember this from two weeks ago. So there's, there's really some dynamic things that you can add there, I think. All right, well, thanks very much. Yeah, You're no okay. problem. 
it's an interesting topic for us, eh, because Moodle has that functionality. So I just rely on Moodle to track student progress. Yeah. We also use H5P. We have the plugin on our website. So our website, uh, teaching.cambriancollege.ca, was built using uh, WordPress. And WordPress has the H5P plugin. And it functions exactly as it would in Moodle. So the plugin is almost the, the same interface across platforms. So it's really cool because if we want to showcase some content that we've created in Moodle, all I do is just download and upload or, well, yeah, I'd have to do that because I can't embed because if someone watches it, they can't go into our Moodle site if it's someone external. But you can download that content, upload it onto our website, and then make that uh, public. Okay, thanks. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. you. Any last questions? I think everyone's signing off. All right. Well, why oh. don't we do the same? <laughs> uh, thanks for uh, tuning in, those of you who remained until the bitter end. We certainly appreciate it. Um, really love the discussion and would love to see anything that you're doing in H5P. I love this tool. I think it's great. I love their open ethos. I'll be promoting it to anyone who will listen. And, and I hope that we've convinced you to uh, at least do a little bit of investigating and then maybe you'll become a, a super fan too. <laughs> I haven't used Zoom before. How do I sign out of, out of it? Uh, bottom right corner, you should see end meeting in red. Oh, got it. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> okay. Bye, everyone. Happy thanks. Halloween. Ciao. <laughs>